my name is John Wheely. I did my PhD at Stanford. I taught at Stanford as well. I've been working in security for like 20 years or so. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the, the interesting thing about security is that it is, uh, it's less of a technology problem and more of a, of a human problem. Um, there's lots of ways to make, make things secure. And, uh, it's just that getting people to actually use them, um, is a whole different story. And so if you're designing a system that, uh, for, uh, for security and you don't take the human element into account, the way that people actually behave, uh, then you won't be successful in the real world. Um, and so just, you know, the basics, the, uh, the, uh, the most basics of authentication, um, authentication roughly um, can be everything around authentication can be separated into like these three classes of thing. Something you know it could be like a password or some other type of knowledge base factor. Something you have, like you know, it could be your phone, it could be a wearable, it could be a Yubi key, you know, um, something that you possess, and then something you are, which is like a biometric. Um, and you know, usually when you talk about multi-factor authentication, you're talking about trying to combine different elements from different multiple of these categories because uh, if you're able to do that then it becomes a lot more difficult to uh, to hack um, because each of these there's no silver bullets in security or authentication um, each of these um, have their own uh, pluses and minuses um, you know if you look at things like knowledge based authentication right i mean this is a notion of like the notion of using private data to authenticate your identity well you know like your mother's maiden name or your social security number your addresses first grade teacher's name these type of things i'm sure you've all had these questions i mean these are all this this entire class of of uh, authentication is susceptible to data breaches obviously i mean you, you think um you know how many people think is it like you know the number of data breaches are going to go down or we're going to somehow solve that problem right it's like, it's just not, we're in the era of the data breach now, and this is, they're just going to continue. Social engineering, you know, it's just not, it's not a question of if somebody will will trick you into, you know, via phishing attack or, you know, or there's another one called vishing where they, they're like, you know, they do it via voice or like, it's just a matter of time before somebody will, uh, will self, social engineer something out of you. Man in the middle, you, it's very hard to tell if there's a man in the middle um, there who's intercepting and, and listening to your communications. Uh, just basic research, a lot of these things, a lot of things you're talking about for pr quote unquote private data. Um, you can just look on somebody's Facebook account or like some some other basic research, you can pretty much guess it, um, a lot of these things. And, or just, you know, attack friends and family. And, you know, it's just the, the number of data breaches that happen. You know, the previously knowledge-based authentication was the primary form of authentication that is becoming less and less the case now. Um, just because of uh, all the problems with uh, these problems with knowledge-based authentication. I mean, not to mention the fact that passwords are terrible and it's and they're really hard to come up with good passwords and it's so easy to get fished and 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 all of this. So um, that's that's on the knowledge-based authentication side. On the biometric side, especially this type of static biometrics. Uh, I mean, number one is that many of the biometrics that you look at, they're not actually private. I mean, you, you know, Apple used to have, to have this thing that said your face is your password. Your face is not your password. Your face is your username. That's the thing that you literally are projecting to the rest of the world to say that this is who I am. Um, and so it's by no means private. Um, even things like your fingerprints are not, not really very private anymore. Um, they're also, biometrics in general are, are, are are in general uh, immutable, which means like they they can't they're not easily changed. Um, so uh, you know things like your fingerprints, you know, they're it's very painful to to, to change them if you if they do get compromised. Um, turns out they're pretty easy to hack. And another thing is that uh, biometrics are often biased against certain groups. Uh, they work better for for some groups than others, and especially depending on what, what you're using the biometrics for, that could be really problematic. You know, if this is being used for um, to identify suspects or, you know, in a crime or like, or things like that, then you really have to be careful around uh, the bias there, you know, and this, uh, no matter if they try, they try to, to, to address these, it's not just a data problem. It's, uh, it, there's, there's, there's deeper things there, um, you know, biased against women, biased against people with darker skin, things like that. Um, and yeah, lots of hacks. And then there's this thing called master prints. Not many people are, are familiar with this, but on your, with your fingerprints, um, like the, the actual readers that they use on, on these phones 
are, are, are small. They're just small sensor readers, and they they're not capturing your whole, your whole fingerprint. They're only capturing they're only actually matching a tiny fraction of your fingerprint. Uh, because of that, you can basically generate synthetic fingerprints that, you know, what they found was they able to spoof 70, 70%, unlock 77% of people's phones by generating this like master set of, of fingerprints. So fingerprints, then maybe it's maybe a one in 50,000, like, you know, uh, rate in terms of your fingerprint matching somebody else's. But if you have a dedicated attacker, they can actually do uh, much better. So, I mean, this all sums up is that high, uh, authentication is not a technology problem, it's a human problem. Um, and, you know, because uh, authentication predates technology. It's, you know, goes back to, I mean, even prehistoric times, how did you authenticate somebody? You look at their face, you hear their voice, you see the context in which you see them, you know, their possessions, things like that. These are all, this, this predates technology. And, you know, for the longest time we've actually, humans have had to adapt to the limitations of the technology by memorizing passwords, having to carry around, you know, little key fobs, things like that. Um, technology has now reached a point where you can just be yourself and there's enough that's unique about you that it's possible to authenticate you. Hi, I'm John Whaley, founder and CEO of UnifyD. And today I'm gonna to show you a demonstration of UnifyD's passive authentication technology. UnifyD makes a mobile SDK for iOS and Android that can authenticate users passively based on their motion and behavior. The accuracy is very high and it doesn't require the user to do anything different. Just be yourself and there's enough that's unique about you that we can actually authenticate you. You can use UnifyD's passive authentication in any case where you need security, but want to have a seamless user experience, not just on the phone, but on other devices as well. Now, one of the worst authentication experiences is when you need to dial into a call center. So we've integrated UnifyD into a banking application on my phone. I've been in possession of my device this entire time. Let's see what happens when I dial into the call center. Hello, John. Thank you for calling in from a known phone. One question, how can we help you today? So with UnifyD, we know not only what device the call is coming from, but who is the person who's holding that device, leading to a much more streamlined user experience. Now let me put my phone down on the table and I'll intentionally not pick it up and try to dial again. To protect the security of your account, we need to ask you some outdated questions that any hacker could answer. What is your date of birth? Could you verify the last time you made a purchase with us? No. See, that is the typical call center experience. Now let me pick up the phone. I'm gonna walk around a few steps and try to dial again. Hello, John. Thank you for calling in from a known phone. One question, how can we help you today? Now, how did that work? Well, we're using two signals here, your unique gait and motion, and also detecting when the phone's put down or out of your possession. It turns out your motion is unique enough that we can actually authenticate users with the same accuracy as a physical fingerprint based purely on their unique motion. And because it runs in the background, you don't need to be walking all the time or even have the app open or the phone unlocked. We can use motion data from five, 10, 15 minutes ago and use that to make an authentication decision. This allows you to understand much more about the context and what the user is doing and incorporate that into an adaptive authentication policy. Now you can utilize the UnifyD mobile SDK not only when you're authenticating on the phone, but also on other devices like doors, smart locks, point of service terminals, and computers. Let me show you how we leverage the sensor data from the phone to provide a more streamlined authentication experience on the computer. Now on the left-hand side, you can see I have the web browser at the FinTech website. And on the right-hand side, you can see what I see on my phone. Now, the first time I go to the website, I need to log in with my email address and password. And now you'll see I received a push notification on my phone asking me to approve the login. So I'm gonna click Accept, and then click to trust the browser. Now I'm in the website. And if I try to do a privileged operation like add a linked account, 
I haven't moved, I'm still sitting here, and so it doesn't ask me for any type of step up authentication. Now I'll click to log out and try to log in again. Again, because I haven't moved, it didn't need to ask me for a password or for a push notification. So these are just a few examples of how you can leverage UnifiD's passive authentication service to authenticate in multiple contexts, both on the phone as well as on the computer. If you want to find out more, come to www.unify.id. That's basically what we do. We're able to actually authenticate people uh, based on their gates with the same accuracy as a physical fingerprint, so about a 1 in 50,000 uh, false positive rate. There's a lot of data science and machine learning uh, that, that goes into it. I'm ha happy to, uh, to go into that uh, in deeper with anyone who, um, you know, who might be interested. Um, but you know, there's, there's, the key is uh, we, we've deployed on over 34 million devices and, then, and so we're able to train very accurate machine learning networks on this uh, you know, to recognize people based on their gate. And if you look at gates, I mean, there's no silver bullets in security or authentication, you know, but I think that gate in some cases compares favorably to what you see in, in uh, some other type of biometrics. Um, you know, where one, one use case that we have uh, with one of our customers, they use uh, QR code payments. So they scan QR codes, uh, you know, to, to make a payment like in a, in a physical uh, store. And uh, guess what, Nick? Now a lot more people are wearing masks because of the, of the pandemic when they're in their store. And so they can't use facial recognition anymore because of the, because of the masks. And so using this type of passive authentication, um, they're still able to get a, a good a good experience in those in those cases. So um, you know this, and when you compare, it compares pretty pretty favorably to things like um, Iris, for example. Iris is about the false positive rate is about one in one hundred uh, there. And you know it doesn't always work with good lighting conditions. Your phone, the phone has to be pretty close. The camera has to be pretty close to your face. You know things like voice is about a one in uh, one in fifty. Um, you know false positive rate, like a two percent false positive rate. Very sensitive to different microphones and uh, and things like that. So there is uh, there's no silver bullets. I mean the the challenge around gate is like you're not always walking. You're not always moving, and so. Um, you know, you uh, it's it's a good signal when you're when you actually are moving. So in cases where I'm walking up to a door, walking up to a car, even I'm walking up to my computer, sit down to log in. Uh, these type of things, gate is a is a pretty useful signal there. Um, but in other cases, it's you know there's uh, there's pros and cons to each of these. Um, yeah, I can get into a lot more of the um, the, the, the science of these um, as well around how these things actually work. It turns out that these sensors. In uh, in in the phone in modern phones are incredibly precise. Um, you know the fact is that the that you can you can tell the difference between no matter how still you are uh, with the phone in your hands, um, you can tell the difference between that and I put the phone on some type of hard surface, um, and so, so we can you use that to tell whether the phone is in your um, in your possession or it's you know you put it down somewhere, um, things like that. And you know, just uh, they they they're also extremely low power. If you look at the you know the the, the type of of power that you usage for these type of sensors, you know, it's in the the, the microamps. You know, so um, you know you can leave you can actually leave them running for for quite a long time, and then uh, and they're actually very efficient. Um, and so this this is one of the uh, one of the features that we use is is motion, and then that's uh, we get we get good authentication results. Um, from that as well, um, yeah. And um, you know, I, again, I can I can go kind of a little bit more into some of the uh, some of the depth of of some of the science behind it. But um, certainly, there is a, a lot of uh, like it, it, I think gate is a is a new biometric factor that uh, that you 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 can you can actually just go to our website and 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 try it out. We have a developer portal. Uh, you can just go to our uh, you know developer.unified.id. Um, anyone can go and hit the APIs and then and, and try it out. Um, and yeah, I encourage anyone who's curious around biometrics or if you have any challenges around, um, you know, fraud or account takeover or you know anything where you want to seamlessly authenticate uh, via mobile app, I encourage you to to go to our website. We have a lot of uh, we have a gate auth API, but we have a lot of other interesting APIs like Human Detect and others uh, that that use behavioral data to uh, to seamlessly authenticate the user.